Welcome, viewers and listeners, to CHP Talks. Uh, I am here in a, another Tim Hortons, this time in Winnipeg, downtown Winnipeg. Elaine and I are working our way back across the country. We should be home in about a week. But uh, today, really privileged to have as our guest Mr. Tom Harris, uh, and we're gonna, I'm going to tell you all about Tom in a minute, but Tom, thanks for joining us today on CHP Talks. Hey, it's great to be on, right? Yeah, I had the privilege of meeting Tom and having a couple of chats with him last week at the, or week before actually, at the Canada Strong and Free Networking Conference in Ottawa. Tom had a booth there and uh, I had a booth. We had some good chats, and we also together uh, watched the leadership debate, the first uh, unofficial leadership debate from the Conservative Party of Canada. But anyway, I'm going to tell you about Tom. He is the executive director of ICSC Canada, which is the International Climate Science Coalition of Canada, a federally incorporated not-for-profit coalition of scientists, economists, and energy and policy experts working to promote a better understanding of climate science and to foster a rational evidence-based discussion about sensible and realistic responses to climate change. Mr. Harris has 30 years experience as a mechanical engineer, project manager, science and technology communications professional, a technical trainer, and he was the s and science and technology advisor to a former opposition senior environment critic in Canada's Parliament. For the past 14 years, he's been working with a team of scientists and engineers to promote a sensible approach to a range of energy and environmental topics, climate change in particular. Mr. Harris is regularly published in newspapers in Canada and the US, occasionally in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK and other countries. He's often interviewed on radio and occasionally on TV. Mr. Harris is the past executive director of the Natural Resources Stewardship Project. We like that word stewardship, by the way. And he's one of hundreds of policy advisors to the Heartland Institute. And today, we're privileged to have him as a guest on CHP Talk. So thanks again, Tom, for joining us today. And we're going to jump right into it and talk about carbon and candidates. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Where would you like to start? We uh, we both witnessed the uh, candidate debate. Uh, the uh, well, five of the six uh, contestants remaining uh, in the Conservative Party. I, of course, I'm with the Christian Heritage Party, and uh, I don't <laughs> either get a chance to vote for or uh, responsibility to vote for because our party uh, has a different set of principles and policies. But anyway. Uh, what did you think about the candidates' uh, perspectives, particularly on carbon and the dealing with climate change? Yeah, it's interesting. In the debate, the elephant in the room was clearly the climate scare because they asked them, how would you defend Canadian energy? And they talked about all kinds of interesting ways. But the one thing they avoided talking about entirely was the major threat to Canadian energy. And that is, of course, the climate scare. I mean, if you look at what the climate activists are pushing, they have something, for example, called the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. And Montreal, Vancouver, Toronto, Westminster, uh, quite a few cities have actually signed it. They're trying to get Ottawa to sign it, which basically means they want us to move off of all carbon-based fuels, in particular natural gas, coal, and oil, as soon as possible. In fact, even sooner. <laughs> so, I mean... Why would the candidates actually support a hydrocarbon fuel future, but at the same time not talk about the major thing that is threatening that future? <laughs> how, how long has this, uh, you know, we're going to talk about some of the details, but how, how long has Canadian politics been influenced or skirting the issue of of uh, carbon and, and our, our need for this precious uh, use, use of this precious commodity. Yeah, it's been going on for a very long, long time. There were some exceptions. Preston Manning, for example, gave what is probably the best speech ever on the climate scare back in 1997 when they were debating the Kyoto Protocol, 
unfortunately, from what I gather and meeting with him actually a few years later, he changed sides on it. And he's accepting that, you know, we are the master controllers of climate, as far as I can tell. And uh, the other person was Bob Mills, who was the opposition senior environment critic. And he was a very strong proponent of real science, as we call them climate realists, people who understand that climate change is natural and that we need to actually adapt to climate change. The idea we can stop it is, is pretty foolish. But Bob gave the 12 hour filibuster during the debate over the Kyoto Protocol. So he also at one point was a very strong proponent of climate realism. The problem is Bob also changed sides. So, you know, I was talking to one of the chairmen after a panel session at the conservative convention. And I asked him, I said, you're all, all talking about the emissions reduction. It sounds to me like you've surrendered the climate debate that we actually have to have emission reduction. And he said, well, we've lost the debate. So we're trying to minimize the damage. And that's a very sad response to give to a, an important issue like this. To me, it's a little bit like saying somebody comes to you and asks for suggestions on how to commit suicide. I mean, you, you know, you're not going to help them. Yeah, you know, cool. at, the very, at the very least, you're going to try to encourage them not to commit suicide. So sadly, what, what the conservative leadership are doing is they are surrendering to the climate scare and just trying to minimize the damage and destruction that the climate scare is causing. You know, it's interesting, since 2015, when the Trudeau government came in, uh, Stephen Guibault, the environment minister, told CTV News that they've spent $110 billion on what he called the climate transition. In other words, trying to stop climate change by moving away from oil, gas, and coal. And, you know, that's a horrible waste of money because even if it were true that we controlled climate, <laughs> Canada is only 1.6% of world emissions. So what we do has no impact. So, yeah, I was very sad in the debate to see that when the topic came up, how would you defend Canadian oil? They wouldn't touch the climate issue. Yeah. Well, I'll just have to interject here as leader of the Christian Heritage Party. Uh, we really appreciate oh, you the information you uh, make available and and uh, just let people know uh, who are listening to the program that we support the responsible uh, use of, of fossil fuels, so-called fossil fuels, resource extraction, uh, uh, processing, distribution, transportation, and sale. Um, there, there are there can be uh, issues with emissions, but it's not the carbon emissions. There can be in uh, in every industry there can be uh, improvements in the, and I think we've seen a lot of improvements in the handling of of uh, waste products and so on in the oil and gas industry, probably in the coal industry too. Uh, oh we'll yeah, to that a little bit as we go along, but. Uh, Certainly, carbon itself is not a toxin. It's a natural and essential component of our of our air that we all breathe. Oh and yeah, plants need it to survive and to, to thrive, and it is a, a part of what we're made of. We human beings, and plants, and animals uh, have a significant portion of carbon in our bodies, and plants in, in the plant material. And uh, so we shouldn't be afraid of carbon. And, and there's a lot of questions. I know you've got the depth of research and I'm hoping that you can uh, explain to us. Well, first of all, before we move on to carbon and why this issue is not being handled properly, can we talk a little bit about the cost of our current carbon fear, carbon uh, scare tactics on, uh, on Canadians, uh, you know, um, maybe a list of, of a few things, carbon taxes, uh, lost revenue, uh, the importation of foreign foreign oil. Of course, now with, with the Ukraine, all of a sudden Russia's uh, exports are becoming a, a topic and uh, the increased cost of electricity when it's uh, not done through the use of uh, fossil fuels. So yeah, you can touch on those topics as you see fit. Yeah, sure. A, a great example is in 2002, I believe it was Dalton McGuinty, who was the previous premier of uh, Ontario, 
He actually said in front of a desk in which he had piled up a big pile of coal, he said, this is old technology. We're going to get rid of coal. And they did. And they brought in you know, hundreds of wind turbines and natural gas plants and everything else. And largely as a consequence of that, Ontario electricity prices tripled, literally tripled. I'm not sure exactly if it's that much right now. It's perhaps at least double. Because you see, the thing is, coal is actually an abundant natural resource that by itself is not clean or dirty. It's just a natural resource. And it depends on how you burn it as to whether or not it actually produces a lot of pollution. And at the time, an engineering consulting firm had done on contract for the Ontario government, a study to see how to reduce real pollution in the case of coal. And what the engineering firm decided and recommended, although it was only re released recently, was that they should not get rid of coal. They should bring in the least expensive forms of energy, or I should say pollution reduction. And we're talking about real pollution, things like sulfur dioxide and nitric oxide and carbon monoxide and soot and things like that. Those are real pollutants. The idea that we have to reduce carbon dioxide is of course a huge mistake. I mean, carbon dioxide right now, despite a 50% rise since 1880, it's actually at one of the lowest levels of CO2 in Earth's history. You know, we've had 10 times as much CO2 at times in the past, and the biosphere did very well. People don't realize that if you go outside right now, uh, you actually have a CO2 starvation for plants, because most plants that we see outside are, in fact, evolved at a time when CO2 was much higher. So they want more CO2. If they have more CO2, like they do in greenhouses, because, of course, they pump CO2 into greenhouses to increase plant growth, they don't need to actually use as much water. So we find that around the world, the 50% rise in CO2 since about 1850 has resulted in a densification of forests, an increase in crop yield, and also parts of the Sahara are greening because regions that were too dry previously to support plant life are now growing plants. So there really is no downside to carbon dioxide, literally none. And, and it's interesting because they go through that in these kinds of reports. I'll just hold it up so people can see. It's yeah. called Climate Change Reconsidered. Climate Change Reconsidered. And the website to get the whole report, and it's thousands of pages, you know, giving the other side of the climate debate, it's climatechangereconsidered.org. That is by far, in my opinion, the best reference source for the other side of the climate debate. They have many volumes. One of them is that one, which is on the science. Another one is on fossil fuels, why we need to keep hydrocarbon fuels and how important they are to human survival. Here's, this is the fossil fuel version. And as you see, there are literally a thousand pages with references from peer reviewed papers all over the world showing that the climate scare is misguided, it's wrong. So uh, the, the basic science that you are talking about, and people, you know, the, the other side often says we're science deniers, climate science deniers, but the, the science that you have, uh, you are referring to and that you've studied for years and years uh, indicates that carbon dioxide is not causing an increase in in our global temperatures is that is that correct well not exactly co2 is a greenhouse gas and thank goodness or the earth would be a frozen ice ball but <laughs> what happens is that as co2 rises from very low levels you get a temperature rise but that temperature rise tapers off okay they call it a logarithmic response where, for example, at the current level, which is 420 parts per million, we could have literally a doubling in CO2 and we would get less than one degree temperature rise. William Happer, who's a professor from Princeton University, we interviewed him on our radio show uh, a few, few weeks ago. He's actually an expert in radiation physics. He studies how much do these molecules really absorb, how much do they re-emit, that sort of thing. And he said that if we double CO2 from today's 420 to 840, not only would the plants love it, but the change in outgoing radiation from the Earth would be only about 
In other words, we'd only hold about 1% more heat with a doubling of CO2. And that would result, according to Dr. Happer, in less than a one degree temperature rise. So if over the next 150 years, we were to double our CO2, it really is anything but a climate emergency. I mean, most people wouldn't even notice it in their lifetime. Yeah. So um, I guess here's a, one of the problems that happens in our, in our public discussion is that the media, whether they're controlled or whether they have just fallen into uh, a line and they, they don't want to, you know, make waves. But, uh, you know, when you make these claims, which I certainly believe, um, there will be people on the other side making, uh, you know, really wild claims to the country. And they'll say, you know, if we don't uh, smarten up pretty soon and, and cut our uh, greenhouse gas emissions, all of a sudden, uh, half the world's going to be underwater, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so how do the people out there, I mean, obviously, they should, they should go and look at the resources you've mentioned, but how do people sort out, and this is true on many levels, uh, not only <laughs> with the climate change and fossil fuels, but uh, with a lot of other things where they say, well, I, we have the science, and the other side says, no, we have the science. <clears throat> how do people sort that out and determine yeah. for themselves? Uh, what is the true science? Well, I think, first of all, we have to understand that the media have some very strong vested interests in what they tell us. OK, you know, the Ottawa Citizen, for example, uh, they used to publish both sides of the climate debate. And so did most news newspapers across Canada in 2000, 2001, around there. I was writing with Dr. Tim Patterson, a geologist from Carleton University, who actually looks at the real record of CO2 in Earth's past. And this is far more significant than the climate models, which we'll talk about in a second, because what he shows is that throughout geologic history, which he can go back about a half a billion years with fossilized seashells, for example, which you can use as a proxy for temperature to determine temperature, he shows that there was no correlation between CO2 and temperature in the real geologic record. So I asked one of the editors, actually, I shouldn't say which newspaper, because he told me in confidence. I asked him, why don't you show both sides of the climate debate? And he said, oh, we agree with David Suzuki. And I said, well, that's very interesting. But you realize, of course, that he was a geneticist. Um, do you have anybody on staff who can actually compare the two sides of the science debate to try and decide who's right? And he said, um, no. So I said, <laughs> so why do you support only one side? Why do you no longer allow bo you know, both sides to be aired so that people can make up their own mind? And he said to me the truth. He said, our advertisers wouldn't like it. And I realized, yeah, it's not just that you know, bad news sells media. And so, of course, their advertisers would love to see the higher circulation numbers. But there's another reason, too. If Canon Printing or Prius take out a full page color ad in the Ottawa Citizen or some other newspaper, you know, the Hamilton Spectator, Vancouver Sun, they're paying, you know, enormous amounts. I mean, last time I checked, it was about $10,000 for a single page. So if these companies are boasting about their products reducing greenhouse gas to save climate, the last thing they want is to have Tim Patterson on the next page saying, you can't affect climate change, at least not measurably. And so, yeah, I think that what's driving it is, you know, that natural tendency to sensationalize things in the press, but also the fact that it's a major moneymaker. So what I would say to people who, you know, think that there's a climate scare is I ask them, OK, if there's a climate emergency, how much has it warmed, say, since 1880? And they'll say, oh, five or six degrees. I say, no, it's 1.2 degrees, according to the UN. If a temperature changes 1.2 degrees in 140 years, you wouldn't even notice it unless you had climatologists telling you it had, it had warmed. I mean, you simply wouldn't notice. And then I would say, well, when do you think the records were set for the most extreme weather? They say, oh, they're happening now. I say, uh, no. If you actually look at the database of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, you find that most of the records were set in the 1930s, okay, during the Dust Bowl. Oh, well, polar bears are dying. 
Well, no, actually they're at the highest number that we've ever seen since we started measuring numbers of polar bears. Oh, well, well, uh, uh, you know, they look for some other concerns. Sea levels rising. Sure, of course, sea levels are rising. It's been rising since the end of the last glacial and it'll continue rising as long as it's warm because of course ice gradually melts, but it's not accelerating. So, you know, none of the actual numbers in the real world support the climate scare. So people might say, well then, What's the climate scare based on <laughs> besides sensationalism from the press and politicians? Well, it's based on computer model forecasts of the future. And the theory is that if you increase CO to a certain amount, you'll get a certain temperature rise, which as William Happer pointed out is actually quite small. But the UN climate models incorporate something called feedbacks. In other words, you get a slight increase in temperature, it causes more water vapor to evaporate and water vapor is a greenhouse gas. So that will accelerate the warming, which will cause more, more um, you know, CO2 to come out of the oceans, et cetera. And so they say that the feedback loop is positive and that this will cause runaway greenhouse warming. So the question then <clears throat> to ask is, well, if you go back 30 years and you plug in the data as to what the conditions were at that time, and then you plug in the CO2 rise that actually occurred, do you get today's conditions? And they call it hind casting. Instead of forecasting, they call it hind casting. And so you have to ask, okay, do the models work at doing that as to what actually happened? And the answer is no. In fact, Craig Itso from CO2Science.org, excellent organization in Arizona, I was watching a presentation of his the other day, and he showed that the forecast warming in the last 30 years is about three times more than the actual warming. So the models clearly don't work, and yet they use those models to forecast climate catastrophe in the future. So that, sadly, is the basis of the climate scare. And, you know, it just simply doesn't work. I can't imagine keeping a stockbroker on your payroll if every time they made a forecast you lost money you know <laughs> so it's, it doesn't make any sense the whole thing from start to finish yeah there's it's been a, a pretty overwhelming uh you know public public opinion shift you know since you know let's say from 30 years ago till now um uh, you know, now people talk about climate change and CO2 as if it's, you know, uh, just a, a done deal. Everybody understands oh, yeah. that the same way they talk about macro evolution and, and a number of things like that. Uh, assumptions are made uh, based on that. And of course, the children uh, who are getting it from the time they can sit in front of a TV and watch a, a cartoon and, uh, and certainly through school uh, at very young ages uh, and through college you know, for sure, they're getting this dumped on them in a very powerful way so that, you know, to go against the flow uh, and to challenge it requires someone who really, uh, really wants to think outside the box, really wants to do a little bit of their own research. Um, do you, how much of an effect do you think politicians have on public opinion? Because we often think of politicians as following public opinion, they're, they're uh, producing, you know, uh, or they're responding to, to public opinion, but do you think they affect public opinion in how they handle it? In particular, we were talking about the conservative leadership contest there and, and uh, their, uh, the way that they're handling this issue. Uh, just... Yeah, exactly. The common wisdom among the candidates right now is that they cannot contest public opinion when it comes to climate change, because otherwise, as Jean Charest said in the Edmonton debate, you know, we'll lose. There's no chance we can form government unless we have an emissions reduction plan. Emissions reduction being carbon dioxide, of course, is what they're talking about. But, you know, they actually have it upside down. In 2012, there was a study done by researchers from McGill University, Drexel University and Ohio State University. And what they were trying to determine is what was it that was the major driver of public opinion? 
And they looked at several things. They, was it extreme weather events, what people actually witness around them? Was it scientific information that they were given by groups like ours? Was it media coverage? Was it the activists? Or was it what politicians and the political parties are saying on the subject? And they found that, and I'll just read directly here, they found that neither extreme weather events nor the promulgation of scientific information had a significant impact on public opinion. And while media coverage did have an impact, the strongest effect came from the position of competing politicians and political parties. And they give a really good example. When John McCain and the other Republicans were supporting the climate scare, there was very strong support in the public for strong action to stop climate change. But when a few years later, the Republicans diverged from the Democrats, they found that support for action on climate change went way down. So if you skillfully pr uh, prepare your messaging, you know, you don't just get up in front of an audience with no preparation and say, oh, humans are not causing climate change, the whole thing's garbage. You have to actually prepare your messaging properly. But if you do and you explain to people the kinds of things I just talked about, then what you find is that a huge number of the public actually come along. So what happens is that the actual statements of the politicians and the political parties is the major driver of public opinion. So if the conservatives are going to wait until public opinion comes along before they take over some sort of leadership, they're going to wait for a long time. So they've actually got it backwards. And, and you know, our public relations and um, communications expert, who's also a political expert, he thinks that what's happening is the backroom people who actually advise the candidates are just too inexperienced to realize that they are, in fact, the major driver of public opinion that they say they're following. <laughs> so well, all, that's that's hap all that's happening is they are reinforcing public opinion, whereas, in fact, they could lead it if they did it skillfully. Yeah. So that's a another positive feedback loop then. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, although, I mean, positive in the sense that it is happening, uh, yeah. negative in the sense of what it's, uh, the damage it's causing in our country. I mean, I think today of the in inflation, some of which is, you know, one of the big factors is uh, certainly the rising cost of fuel. Carbon taxes are a big part of that. And of course, uh, government overspending is all kinds of issues that we are concerned about uh, that are impacting the cost of living. But uh, the fuel cost is affecting Canadians in a big way and will continue to do so. And it's not just the direct fuel cost. Can you, uh, can you afford to go on a trip this summer? It's every item that you buy from the grocery store is uh, cost more because the trucker had to pay more for the fuel, et cetera, et cetera. It backs up in every oh, yeah, in every area you know, to a phenomenal extent. Um, so so uh, you, you have some advice for, like, uh, I know where we stand, uh, Christian Heritage Party stands on uh, science, the same science that you rely on, and, and the, the use of the materials, the resources that God has entrusted to us uh, as human beings and as Canadians. But what would be your advice for the candidates that are still contesting for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada? Right. Well, the first thing is don't fight the battle on the ground that your enemy occupies. OK, this is an old saying from the Chinese. You don't, the Chinese general, you don't use the techniques or accept the language of your opponents. And, you know, language is actually a very important weapon of war. There's a number of studies that have been done that show how language affects people's thinking patterns. And if you think back to the book 1984, you remember at the end, there was an appendix, a 10 page appendix. Uh, it was called Newspeak. And they talked about how they were affecting the thinking pattern and eventually the behavior of the population with their use of language. You remember the, the Ministry of Truth, you know, and the Ministry of Peace and things like that. Yeah. Well, in this case, the conservatives, sadly, at this point, are actually helping their enemy. They're helping the people who want to kill our major source of revenue in Canada, namely our fossil fuels. 
by using the language of our enemies. What they do is they call it carbon pollution. They call it carbon emissions, carbon footprint, et cetera. And it isn't, of course, it's carbon dioxide. Carbon, as you say, is a naturally occurring substance. If we were truly trying to control carbon emissions, we would be worried about soot. Okay, because soot is actually amorphous carbon, it's without structure. And then, of course, when you start to structure carbon, you get things like graphite and you get diamonds. I mean, those are real carbon. So the very first step they should take is stop using the language of their enemy. My God, what do you have to actually agree to? Why would you agree to it? And so that's number one. Stop using their language. Call it carbon dioxide. And the second thing they should do is say, look, Canada is 1.6% of world emissions. So regardless of what you believe in the case of what causes climate change, our impact is negligible. China will make up for it in a few weeks with their expansion and they're building coal stations all over the world, which by the way, we should talk about because coal is not something we should get off, quite frankly. Uh, and so what Canada's sensible approach to climate change would be to prepare for climate change, adaptation. Now, right now, the federal government are only spending 13% of their money on adaptation. 87% is going to this impossible goal of trying to stop climate change. So that's number one. They should stop, or sorry, number two, they should stop using the opponent's language. And second, they should promote adaptation as a sensible approach. The third approach is that no matter what happens to climate, whether it gets hotter or colder, and colder is much more dangerous for Canada, of course, one degree drop of temperature on the prairies, and we could lose entirely one of our wheat crops. So we should prepare mostly for the most dangerous thing, and that would be cooling. And cooling, in fact, is more likely. We can talk about that in, in, a, in a minute. But so we should also, besides those first two things, adaptation and use the right language, they should also ensure we have a resilient, inexpensive supply of energy. Because without sufficient energy, without reasonably cost energy, we cannot adapt to whatever climate change occurs. You know, we don't want to move off of coal, oil, and natural gas because they are solid, reliable energy sources. And I should say something about coal. You know, it's interesting because sadly, Pierre Polyev much as he's brave on many topics, is not very brave when it comes to climate change because he's advocating carbon dioxide sequestration underground and storage, which will do nothing to stop climate change. It will have virtually no impact on CO2 over the, over the whole world, and it will cost a fortune. It'll actually increase all of our electricity prices. Unfortunately, Pierre also supports electric vehicles, which of course is another uh, boondoggle, but he also wants to get developing countries off of coal onto our natural gas. But you know, coal actually has an important benefit over natural gas that most people don't realize. And that is, well, first of all, you can burn it very cleanly with proper pollution control. But coal stores perhaps a year's worth of supply on site, right on site. Okay, so it's not dependent on a pipeline that's coming in with natural gas or oil or something else. So it's much more resilient to terrorist attack or to infrastructure breakdown, things like that, because it has its energy source stored right on site. The same thing actually applies for nuclear power. Those two energy sources are much more secure from the point of view of the grid than the other sources that require constant input of, of uh, natural gas or oil. And, uh, and so, you know, you get a city like Winnipeg, for example, three incoming supply lines for natural gas, I understand, the terrorists actually could knock out a couple or even all three with a with just, you know, just a hand grenade, really. And that could cripple Winnipeg in the middle of the winter. They couldn't do that with coal. So coal should be retained, especially because it's a very inexpensive energy source. And China and India, both of them get most of their electricity from coal. So we should encourage them to use the latest pollution control for sure, but not to get off coal. So that's what the Conservative Party should be doing. Instead, they're promoting the climate scare with the exception of Roman Babur, who's actually not committed one way or the other. He's actually not said much on it, but all the rest of them either directly, well, you know, Patrick Brown, Jean Charest, they're 
they're promoting the climate scare like crazy. Uh, they really push it hard. But um, and then Lesson Lewis is a bit softer on it. She's very strong on energy, which is great. But she is somewhat of a climate alarmist. Uh, then you have Scott Atchison. He's actually supporting Sheree on this issue. So Polyev and Bobber, my hope is that they will turn the corner and become more realistic. And of course, uh, uh, although we're talking about carbon, uh, because we're discussing these conservative contestants uh, as leader of Christian Heritage Party, I have to speak up and say that uh, uh, we watched the debate. We were watching uh, largely what the response would be on the issue of protection of preborn human life, uh, right. having to do with abortion and that kind of thing. And of course, uh, most people realize, but if they don't, they know it now, <laughs> that Leslie Lewis is the only one uh, willing to speak up in defense of preborn human life. And so uh, all the others, including Polyev, are either trying to avoid the issue or have come out clearly. Polyev has come out clearly and said that he uh, supports abortion uh, uh, as, a as a viable choice. So uh, yeah. anyway, so we're interested in that. But we people uh, for whom this issue is really critical, uh, if they're voting they have only one choice, but when it comes down to climate change, we'd like to see the same smart people do the same, you know, take a smart approach to uh, climate change and carbon as well. Yeah, yeah I hope Leslie Lewis will come around. I mean, I, would, I was trying to meet with her after the debate because I think that, you know, various policies she has would be really augmented by having a climate realist approach. And, and you know, it's interesting, at our booth, at the conservative convention here in Ottawa, we had literally hundreds of people talking to myself and my daughter and our communications expert, and they did not support the climate scare. They did not want to see emissions reduction as part of the conservative platform. So there's a huge disconnect between the base who want a realistic climate policy that focuses on adaptation, for example, and the leadership who all seem to want to go be with the cool kids, you know, they, they want to actually have a climate uh, plan in which involves emissions reduction. And, you know, you have to ask, well, why are they doing it when the base don't want it? And I think what it boils down to is two things. One is many of the behind the scenes uh, advisors to these candidates are in fact red Tories. They're people who are thinking ahead to getting a job in the communications sector here in Ottawa, where most of the communications companies are actually left wing. So I, I think they don't want to be tainted with this issue. And the second thing, of course, is that they are personally uncomfortable with the attacks that would ensue. But you know, Danielle Smith brought this up. And sadly, she brought it up at a CBC sponsored event, which <laughs> had a stacked audience. And of course, she got massacred, but she didn't do it in an intelligent way. So I'm not saying that uh, Pierre Polyev or Babur or Leslie Lewis should get up and do what Daniel Smith did. But what they should do is when they're accused of being a climate change denier, which is the inevitable response, they have to just sort of make light of it and say, well, well, that's pretty ridiculous. If there wasn't climate change, we'd be under two kilometers of ice right here from the height of the last glacial. So obviously there's climate change. Then the answer is, well, you don't think humans cause climate change. And the answer, of course, is easy again. You say, well, of course we cause climate change. It's warmer in the cities than it is in the country. And CO2 probably contributes a little bit to that warming. Indeed, if it weren't for CO2, we'd be a frozen ice ball. Oh. So they're kind of stuck now. So then they would say, well, well, you don't think we're causing a climate catastrophe? And you'd say, OK, well, how much do you think it's warm since 1880? You know, that kind of thing. So if they had a sensible way to respond to these charges, the audience would just laugh and they'd think, yeah, of course, it makes sense. <laughs> so uh, I, I think uh, you would be a good one leading a, uh, a policy discussion on this. And not only in the Conservative Party, I think the, the other parties, of course, the Liberals, the NDP, the Greens, which are wrong on so many issues, uh, yeah. they would, could benefit from uh, having a, a good classroom uh, lecture on this topic as well, because I think on this, you know, and it goes back, to, you know, it could be about uh, gender issues, it could be about the, the handling of the COVID crisis, it could be about the, what what the truckers uh, freedom convoy was all about, but 
but so many of the politicians, unfortunately, I think just get their their uh, news or their perspective of world events pre-digested by uh, taxpayer-funded CBZ, and they never get the real story. So uh, yeah, we have well, we to. Need, you know, we need leaders that will be brave. Yeah. <laughs> we need leaders like you. I mean, we need leaders who will actually stand up for principle. I mean, if the conservatives are not going to stand up for principle, if I were a grassroots in the party, and I'm not, I, I didn't join any party on purpose, but if I were, I would actually rather the conservatives stood up for principle on things like climate change and, and, and other issues and remained in opposition, but could bring up those issues in public, then they formed a government and they succumbed to political correctness. Because in that latter scenario, you would have nobody in the House of Commons standing up for you know, real conservative values. So people say, well, you want Pierre or Justin Trudeau to win. I say, well, if the choice is between having Justin Trudeau as prime minister and a strong principled conservative opposition or the conservatives in power with very similar policies to Trudeau, I would rather have the first scenario. I'd rather they lost. And of course, if they lost again, hopefully they might re-examine their policy and say, oh, this didn't work for the fourth time. <laughs> well, we, we saw it in the last iteration with under Aaron O'Toole where he uh, basically backtracked on almost every principle that uh, yeah. that he people thought that he represented. And of course, uh, carbon was one of them where he was going to get rid of the carbon tax, but then he had his own plan for a new carbon tax. And, uh, you know, it just became so ridiculous in the end. But, but there's this illusion that has been there for a long time that, that the Conservative Party or conservative-minded people have to uh, keep adapting instead of adapting to climate change they're adapting to the you know the public opinion polls and uh, by doing so they kind of um, i think they diminish themselves in the eyes of the public it, it loses respect for them uh, because yeah. what, you know they express one one day as a so-called conviction the next day is changed out of, out of convenience or um, an appeal to reach out the so-called big blue tent that has been talked about for ages they want everybody in the big blue tent but once you get in there if you don't agree with the uh, the official narrative then they don't want you anymore so yeah uh, anyway i agree with you that politicians should stand up and speak the truth boldly proclaim it say tell people where they stand and let the chips fall where they may but at least people know where they stand and it shouldn't be a bunch of uh, yeah you know, just shilly jallying around important issues. Well, and also it's important to remember there's a couple of good examples of people who actually stood up for climate realism, said what was true, and they did succeed. I mean, the obvious example is Donald Trump. Okay, he became prime our president despite media hating his guts, and he perhaps won the last election. We don't really know. <laughs> there's a lot more evidence that he might really have won. But regardless, he was successful. And he never accepted the climate scare. And think about Stephen Harper. Before Stephen Harper actually was even elected as head of the Conservative Party, he said Kyoto is a money-making socialist scheme. I mean, yeah. you can't even you can't be more derogatory than that. I mean, he didn't buy it, and he became leader of the party, and he eventually became prime minister. Now, sadly, after becoming prime minister, they approved the Paris Agreement, and you know they went over to the other side again. But the, the bottom line is, you can be elected if you're intelligent and strong. And I think, based on our observation at the conference, that conservative grassroots want a strong, confident leader, not one who bows to political correctness, but somebody who uses intelligence to fight the opposition and to win. That's what we really need. Otherwise, what we end up with, you know, in the book, Rules for Radical Conservatives, they say in that book, look in the mirror, what do you see? You see a weakling, a coward, a spineless jellyfish, you know, and you're not going to fight us. And he, this is a left winger speaking to conservatives, telling them how they took over the institutions, they're saying, because we've already won. <laughs> Just do, go along, come along, come with us. And that's what they're doing. So I don't see any point, quite frankly, in voting for a conservative party who 
are just doing a kind of liberal light. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, we, we couldn't agree with you more, Tom. Uh, yeah. We, uh, for 35 years, have been uh, telling people our opinions uh, based on science, uh, as we understand it, on this topic and many others, uh, life, family, and freedom topics. But uh, we're, we're going to close this off for now uh, before I get thrown out of the Tim Hortons here. <laughs> and uh, but thank you for joining us. I think there's a lot more to be said on this topic and and I look forward to having another chance to speak with you. Maybe I'll be at my own desk at home next time and a uh, little less distraction in the background. But for people who want to know more about you and about the organization, um, the website for the, uh, uh, give, give us the website. The yeah, URL. sure. It's icsc-canada.com. And in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a little window where you can put your email address in. You don't even have to tell us your name. Just put in your email address and we'll keep you up to date. We have a monthly newsletter that we just put out, which we can send people and also, you know, various media hits because we have media hits practically every day somewhere in the world. So yeah, do go to icsc-canada.com. And of course, if you like what you see, there's also a donate button, which of course every nonprofit always has to get some donations just to survive. So we hope people, if they like it, they can give us a donation. So we'll learn more about Tom Harris and the work of the International Climate Science Coalition dash Canada at ICS dash Canada dot org. At ICSC, I'm sorry, ICSC. I'm sorry. <laughs> icsc-canada.org thank you Tom uh, dot com <laughs> yeah. oh okay well we will have it in the show notes as well so uh, people can find it there thank you for taking the time to be with us today appreciate the good work you do it was great chatting with you at the conference we look forward to uh, more in the future and may the truth prevail on this and many other issues facing uh, Canadians today so yeah. Uh, to our listeners and viewers, uh, tune in again next week for another edition of CHP Talks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.